Hello again, I'm Sue Swinand. Welcome to another half hour of Arts and Ideas. My guest today is Steve Dorado, a nationally known artist and photographer whose work just blows me away. He's a warm and vibrant personality, a mentor and a faculty member at Clark University. I'm delighted to have Steve Dorado with us here today. Welcome. Steve, I'm so glad you brought the camera. I almost can't see you without <laughs> that camera over your bag like uh, Santa Claus, you know. Look, I never leave home without it. Pack. I yeah. never leave home without it. I've had a camera over my shoulder since I was like about two or three years old. I know. I, I, when I read that you had been a uh, freelance photographer when you were 17, it kind of says a lot about the kind of uh, work you do, yeah. the kind of dynamo worker you are and uh, how you've been paying the dues all these years in the city of Worcester. You're sort of like a household word in the art community here. Well, you know, I was born in Worcester, raised in Marlboro, and I have family in Worcester, and I have family in Boston, so it really is my hometown. And, uh, you know, there's never a feel of paying my dues. It's what I do yes. and what I what love, and love. I'm passionate. I'm I think very if passionate there was a it. word that I could use to describe you besides dynamo and character, <laughs> it would be <laughs> pr passion. Um, you really yeah, have a passion yeah. for your work. Yeah, thank you so much. And it shows yeah. in everything you do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to start by giving a little bit of your background. Uh, it's quite, I know you're a graduate of the Worcester Art Museum School, which is very I, nice. I am in 1979. And then the, your BFA was from the, Mu Mass, from the Mass, Mass College of Art in Boston. And uh, you're currently a senior lecturer in photography at the, in the School of Visual and Performing Arts at Clark, Clark University. University. And what really knocked me over was that I realized you started there in 1985. Um, and I actually, added you know it what? up, Since and that's 25 <laughs> years. <laughs> actually, you know what? 84, 80, 83, 84 is when I actually started Come on, there. you're a kid. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a kid. Yeah, I, I am a kid. Thank you so much. I am a kid. Well, the fact is, I remember you when you were a kid in '84. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, like I said. I'm so still a kid. It, it's amazing to see how far you've gone in the art world. Uh, when I speak about some of your uh, accomplishments here, you know, your resume is just uh, it would take an, a, a two-hour program. But, uh, you know, the fact that you're in collections at the New Britain Museum of American Art, the Fitchburg Art Museum, the Berlin National History Museum, the Courier Museum in New Hampshire, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Worcester Art Museum, and another two pages. And then that you've had one-person shows at the De Cordova and the, I mean, I'm leaving out tons and tons yeah, of it's, things. It's, but, uh, it's a job. <laughs> It's a job, it's but a steady you job. do it well, and you um, work hard to I'm, I'm, get it you know, out there. I would there. say that it's seamless. My pleasure and my work are all one and the same, and they're yes. galvanized. You're very And lucky. I don't work, I do work seven days a week. I, I don't even want to use the word work. No. Um, I, I'm an artist seven days a week. I don't know how to function outside of that box. And because I work at a constant rate year round, that things accumulate. That's right. And they have That's to get out. Right. It overflows. And every now and then it overflows in a collection or a museum show or it overflows um, um, you know, uh, into the public. It gets yes. out there into the yes. public. Well, uh, you know, you've done all these wonderful series, which have I've seen most of these shows. The Fitchburg Art Museum, you did the uh, dinner series just in 2008. 2007, the Decordova Museum Sculpture Park, the Jump, the Jump series, series, which I can't wait to show you. You're mm. going to love that one. Um, uh, and these series that you've been doing, they're really uh, long-term documentary projects. Some of them are 25 years, 26 years in the making. Where uh, you uh, follow that subject and that idea. Right. And, and then some just, they'll, they'll like, uh, we're going to talk about the Celestial series in a bit. And in the case of the Celestial, when a Celestial event happens, comes about, let's say a comet appears in the night sky, the series begins, the to comet bubble leaves, up again. the series goes into dormancy until something and else comes up. And then it boils up. up to high pitch when the event occurs. Oh, I, I sleepless yeah. nights, yeah. sleepless nights. So these documentary projects are really uh, very often about people. You're so much a people person. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm using the words uh, social structures that you mentioned right. in your uh, bio, but uh, also about the nuances of community, family, yeah. individuals. Yeah. 
you're so sensitive to people and their vulnerabilities and uh, and so on. It's all about family, and, and my family, uh, of course, is blood, but it's also community. It's all one and the same. Uh, as an artist, I feel that uh, uh, w there's a connection, there's an emotion that, that we, we're, we're more sensitive to things around us. And, and, uh, and I, I am a people person. I'm, uh, I'm Italian, so let's we'll start there. <laughs> you know, the table being the center of all activities, the community, and again, that's one of my series called the Dinner Series that I've been shooting for over 25 years. Uh, the hierarchy of what happens, the, the, uh, the main players, the, uh, the main, main event. Yes. Uh, and then that, that reaches out into the community in itself that I can photograph um, a number of families that I befriended throughout the years and go and stay with them and live with them and cook for them and then photograph all of that. So and it's how a life. Passionate. It's, it's a it's, life. It's all yeah. seamless. You know, like I, I feel like we're talking about these series and we should start to show some of the yeah, images. Uh, yeah, where do you so, want to go? Uh, I like the fact that we have the little... Actually, uh, on the screen here, yeah. we have a uh, photo that was made, and I just found this recently, uh, and uh, I'll leave it like this, 1959, and it's a photo of my father, who, by the way, uh, was an artist for the state of Massachusetts, a, a, a state worker for something like 30 or 36 years. Was that like years. with WPA? Yeah, he did, no, 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 uh, actually uh, DPW, <laughs> Department of Public Works. Oh, I see. And he was the man who, when we were growing up in Massachusetts back in the 19, late 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the um, 80s, that when you opened up the Boston Globe or the Worcester TNG uh, or the newspaper on the Cape and there was a new bridge that was being built or a new public works building or a new rest area, the artist rendering was Gene Dorado. The my rendering, father, the, the, rendering, the artist rendering. rendering was my father, no and so I grew kidding. up with a, an artist. My 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 father I didn't know that. was uh, an artist, an amazing artist, and so I would sometimes go into Boston with him to his work, uh, which was uh, not far from the garden, and uh, so I got to hang out. So that's in the Italian tradition of being in the atelier in the studio of your father. You know, it, it, you know, I was his apprentice. <laughs> that's great. He taught that's me how to great. draw at a very early age, and this photo we're looking at taken in 1959, he gave me a, uh, uh, an old Keystone uh, movie camera to hold on to, and he's posing behind me. And I, I was saying, I always had a camera in my hand my entire life, and here's proof. <laughs> so when was, you started doing photography seriously when you were uh, 17, and then what was your first big uh, show after your, uh, you know, uh, as you, you came out into the... Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I, I wanted to start to photograph uh, at the age of 12. My father was teaching me how to draw, and he said that photography was the bottom of the food chain. Don't go there. And this is in the 70s when photography really didn't have a high status. Uh, it was not a high form of art. It really was a function. It was it's right. uh, Things utilitarian. Things have changed very much yeah. over the last 30, yeah. 40 and, years. And, but yet I felt because of my stiletto pace, the fact that I'm kind of obsessive compulsive and that I, I, I think fast, I, I talk fast, uh, that the camera was speaking to me in the sense that it was a conduit to that kind of emotion, that kind yes. of speed. And, immediate. It, it, it was immediate. immediate. It was it was success and failure, uh, yes. all one one roll of film. Whereas my father did teach me how to draw and paint, and it w as as you as an amazing artist know that it's weeks before you realize that you blew it or were successful. And uh, so I uh, did. Or months before you wrestle it to the ground. To the ground. Say, you know, <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah, I, or it, which is a well, great, a wonderful feeling. Uh, and, and I love those feelings. I love that accomplishment. And I found that the camera uh, was uh, more set to my heart rate. Yes. So um, my, you, you, to That's bring a good it point. forward, yeah, that um, I, I was photographing seriously by the time I was in high school. I was actually teaching like a, a class in high school. I resurrected an old dark room. I, was, I created a club there. I don't know if it's there in Marlboro High School anymore. And then from there, I went on to the colleges that you mentioned. And uh, I like the idea of getting the work out there. That was really important for me. I mean, what's the point? The point is that it's a way of communicating and expressing your emotions. That's right. And one thing I always tell my students, it's all about me, me, me. It's my life, my world, and I'd like to have you share it with me at times. So um, my very, very, very first show outside of the college was actually 1982, and it was a gallery in Worcester called Artworks. And I convinced Jane Morgan. I remember. Yeah, yeah no, she's sure, still there she's, to this Jane day. Jane is still there. She still has and, some of my work. Uh, so Jane and uh, at her time, at that time, her husband um, 
uh, gave me a show in uh, late summer, in August, and uh, that was the beginning of my career. I actually got reviewed in the local papers, and uh, the Clark University, you know, it's at the right, ta right place at the right time. And Clark University was looking for somebody to run the darkroom complex, and the reviewer happened to be a teacher there, Marilyn Goodman, another blast from the past. And she said, name. hey, would you know anybody who would like to work the darkrooms at Clark University? And it's like, you know, oh, me, 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 me. Hello. Yeah. I was literally washing windows <laughs> right out of school. A real job. A real job. And <laughs> In so photography. It was phenomenal. And then what happened was I started teaching classes very, very early in my career. And then uh, my next big show uh, was, uh, matter of fact, we should go to it. Let's it was, go. It the was Pond? Pond, and that's where, oh, yeah, I so let's go to Belpon. Excuse me, where You know, my I looked on? at that series on the internet the other night, and honestly, it could bring tears to your eyes. It is just so poignant, and so, it's so much capturing the whole, it, it's, it's empathy for all mm -hmm. the humanity, yeah. the, the hopes and fears and, uh, the vulnerability, the, you know, it, it's just wonderful. Um, this, this, is, this is my career happening right here in front of us with Bell Pond, and we'll go through a couple of these. Look at the way those buildings in the background right. uh, juxtapose yeah. against those little frail people yeah. in the front. Yeah. It's the environment they're in, you know, it, it, it's, it's so, I just feel such empathy for them through your photograph, which you've... Uh... You know, uh, driving around central Massachusetts back in 19... And this is the summer of 83, and now no longer saying, I am a student who makes art, I am an artist who makes art, which is a very frightening thing, by the way, because you could hide behind your teachers when you're in school. And so looking for a project, I came across Bell Pond, which is on top of Route 9 in Belmont Hill here in Worcester. Sure. And I was living in Westboro at the time. And I, this was a, you know, a wonderful pond that's in a very surreal environment. And, and the funny it, thing is you live like a stone's throw from there now, right the, now. Today I yeah, do. I live like, like about half a mile away. And there was all of this activity. And I get out of my car and uh, with uh, a camera very similar to the one that's over my shoulder here. And I introduced myself. Um, and I actually said to the neighborhood, uh, that I have no business being here, that I'm this, you know, middle class, you know, white kid, uh, Catholic background, Italian background, and I have no business to photograph you, but I would like to get permission to photograph you. And um, I had them participate with this camera, looking underneath the dark cloth, so to see their the images. So they had the fun of being part of a project. Yeah, and I gave them every single day, the very following day, a photo uh, that I made the previous and day. Respect, and respect, and, and they cooperation, got it. and yes. Yeah, and they got it. We'll go, we'll go through a couple of these. And so we're seeing, you know, relationships forming with lovers. We're seeing the, uh, the old neighbor who would follow me around, Chick that I'm showing you right now. And he would actually watch me work throughout the afternoon I smoking cigarettes. I love the way that building is behind, yeah, right and, behind his head. Yeah, and as an artist, you know, I'm working on a very emotional level. You oh, know, my yeah. intimacy with the camera coming in very close to my subjects. Again, conversing for hours on end before I make a photo. And look how cool he is with those sunglasses Chick was and the that best. cigarette. And know? by the way, that's C-H-I-C-K. The K makes it masculine for his name. I'll never forget oh, these really? stories. And here's three generations of a um, Hispanic family from the daughter to the archetype, uh, the, the, the male center, the wife and the grandmother that you see with the rollers in her hair. And I just fell in love with these people. I gave them photos as thank yous. I listened to their comments about them. And I carried their lives through from May 11th, it comes to mind, to the mid-October of 1983. Now, you know, uh, just real quick is that I shot a thousand sheets that summer. And out of a thousand, I actually came up with a hundred photos, which is the best odds I've ever had with any project. So it's one out of ten. Uh, it's never been like some of my my odds now are like one out of sixty or one out of eighty. And f uh, a sheet of film these days is five dollars a shot. So uh, is a now enormous are you shooting amount of money. digitally mostly? Um, now, or I, you still I shoot doing, almost exclusively uh, stills with this big camera here. So that's the film. That's the film. I've been shooting digital, and we'll talk about that later on, uh, by making little movies. I make little movies now. Wow, well, I'm a student making little movies. But the, the Bell Pond process taught me how to be responsible. Be responsible to the public, be responsible my, to myself as an artist, and to make those connections in the most humble, sincere well, way. Well, you have a real talent for uh, setting up a rapport with your subject. Yeah. And through respect and empathy right. and uh, collaboration, yeah. you get something which is unique. Yeah, it's, it's not my place to judge. It's my place to absorb everything that's available in front of me and make the best possible narrative, story possible. 
so that you, my second cousin, my grandmother, my intellectual friend, can read that information and go as deep as they want to go with yes. that one single photo. So yes. for me, you know, I every love single it one when is a painting. One photograph can say, I, I yeah. love any artwork. I just had a big discussion with somebody at the museum yesterday about mm -hmm. this in Boston. But we're talking about the fact of whether an artwork, one form, one object, yeah. can carry its message on its own two feet whether it can communicate right. on its own in this place, right. in that place, in this time, yeah. in that time. And that is something really special, I think. It, it, it's, it's the investment. A lot of work you need the whole, you know, you need to see 40 before you get the point. You know, or you need to see. You're right. Sometimes the statement things are designed you get to be in point. series. And or by the way, these are a lot. I, I call them series. That. But but at each time that I make the image, uh, the art, it, it's about that moment, and to have that be its own solace, its own, its own it's crystalline completeness. Point. Yeah. The bigger picture is seeing these in succession of many. Oh, that and, adds to it for and sure. And it could be in book form. Yes. And it can be on the wall of gallery yes. museum. But you see. I think is would it be fair for me to say you're a very formalist artist? In oh sense. yeah, actually, your yes. your work is composed and each piece is complete and perfect as it is. Are we going to do more of the bell pond? Uh, uh, let's go through a couple let's more. Let's just go through and a so few more. And so we're saying here and a family uh, with a with a stepfather who I saw as a symbol. Are you who using was any lights? In, I, these? in this case, I'm using uh, a there's, strobe. Because there's a little bit of a strangeness of yeah. light about yeah. them. Well, you know, which actually puts them in a different plane. It puts them, you look at them a little bit differently yeah. and you you know that this is a special moment or I can't explain why, but the lighting is somehow different. It's an element that I brought into play back in the 80s, particularly starting with Balpon. And again, these were decisions made the night before, the second night before I went to the pond. And I shot the pond from about three in the afternoon to sunset every single day, unless With it was raining. With natural light in the and, first uh, but day? There, I, the first day was natural light, and also to see if I could even do this. Yeah. And then when I came back, I realized the second day it was happening and it was gonna be a commitment for the summer. And it was my decision to um, bring an extra, or a uh, strobe with me uh, and illuminate these people like you see in the magazines. I didn't want it to be a language that was remote to you at this point, but something that was familiar. So to illuminate them, to pull them from the background, was to make them my stars. That they, they were to, to put uh, them in the spotlight. The spotlight. And uh, yet, at the same time, not in a real stylized way where you're looking at the style, but you, like you just said, there's something about them that, quote unquote, illuminating. Yes. And so that was part of my language that I was it learning during this period. It takes them into a different place. And it also allows you to develop this crystalline clarity of yeah. form, yeah. which I feel is consistent in your work as yeah. I go from one series to another. And for me, which is where the real communication yeah. comes through the pure visual elements. Yeah. The forms, yeah. the lines, the colors, the values, the, you know, that's the textures. That's where this wonderful communication comes from at the deepest root level. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a real honor. It really is. So segue to the mall series. Another great story. Uh, all of these photos, as, as dynamite as they might seem, that there's a lot of connections about how things get networked. So, okay, so I have this Grove Street show, Bell Pond, in 1984. By the way, I think we had five to 600 people come to the opening. And uh, I got a wonderful grant to help supply for the refreshments. Well, the other so, thing about those series, you know, we talk about social structures and uh, and it, it showing the humanity of the community, you might say. That was very, it, as you say, the community was hungry for it. You know, The museum yeah. wanted to bring people, to yeah. engage yeah. people. It was all about, yeah. yeah. It, you know, it, it, I, I, duh, you know, I'm like, uh, it really is true. It's like, you know, these words that I said were cheap at first and then they got filled up with substance. 
So uh, the community did come. The writers did come. The magazines did come. The newspapers came, and they did all kinds of articles on Bell Pond. I I was um, I became a, a the, the Dorado name became a thing separate yeah, from me, yeah. which actually I found fascinating also. But that Dorado name helped me get the show at the Wistrop Museum. So the director at that time, Tom Freudenheim, a wonderful person, calls me up out of nowhere and he says, "Mr. Dorado, I just saw Bell Pond down the street at the Grove Street Gallery, and I I ordered my entire staff to go see this show, and I need to meet you." No. So kidding. yeah, and so oh, I'm wow. like, uh, how about right now, since I'm semi-unemployed, oh, working yeah, part time I, I, at a university, <laughs> and he's where are you? Yeah. I'm there. <laughs> so I, I walked into his office literally hours later, and he laughed and he said to me, "You're not Stephen Dorado," and I'm like, "I'm Stephen Dorado," and he says, "No, you're not the guy that shot Bell Pond," and I'm like, "I'm the guy that shot Bell, shot Bell Pond," and he said, "No, no, that's the end of the career of an artist, not the beginning," and I said to him, "Are you telling me that this is a one-hit song?" He says, yeah, I think that's what this is all about. And, I, and he said, what are you going to do now? And I said, well, you know what? I'm, I'm this middle class kid born in 1957. And you know what? Bell Pond was a huge experience. But I was photographing people that I was learning about, but they're not me. They're not my life. My life is malls. I'm 1957. Malls came into existence in 1957. <laughs> I hate malls. I said, this is the most difficult thing that I can think of documenting. And nobody has even put it on their radar yet. I'm going to start to document, document you and me and how we live. And he said, it's impossible. It's too transient. You can't pull it off. And I put my hand out to Tom. And I said, Mr. Freudenheim, I want to shake your hand and make a bet. And if I can come back here six months from now with a portfolio showing wow, up during the wall, what I want to have, yeah, I want to have a one-person show, motivator. a one-person show at this museum. Oh my God. And he laughed and he said, "You're on." And we shook. And I went home and I freaked out because I was like, "What am I going to do with this?" So I, uh, using the name, nothing, using Dorado name, I actually got myself into a couple of malls in the area because I was the guy who did Bell Pond. Yeah. This is how things feed off of one That's another. That's right. And I started, I got permission to walk in with Cold this camera momentum. over my shoulder and go in. And I started making Bell Pond photos in the mall. Let's show a So few. we'll show a couple of those. And what was happening at the beginning here was that um, I was actually replicating all of the feel good stuff that uh, was happening at Bell Pond. And you know what? That wasn't the mall. There were a lot. And so I had to reinvent myself. I had to literally break myself down go back into history, which is always our strength as artists, to learn from. We don't create anything out of nothing. So I had to go back and I had to look at, you know, I was looking at Caravaggio for his lighting and his drama, and I was looking at photographers like Brassai who photographed Paris by night, oh, and this yeah. guy Bill Brandt who photographed in London, and I was looking at, at the constraints of the way that they framed uh, nocturnally a lot of things vertically instead of horizontal because you get the sense of entrapment when you do that. And I brought the same light with me but it changed. It no longer was a direct light but it was a light that illuminated from, it was from theater. It was something more dramatic. Yeah. And I started making these images. I shot 3,700 photos and I picked 57 that Ooh. worked for me. I went to Tom Freidenheim about a year into this project and I laid out these, some of these photos on his desk and he said to me, when do you want your show? Wow. And I said to him, in about two years, because this is really a hard project, but I think I'm cracking the egg here on this one, or cracking the, the nut, as they say, I guess. And um, I, I came to him along with uh, uh, Stephen Jarecki, the wonderful curator, and we had this great Who show. should be given a lot of credit because he really brought now photography we'll the into, the, uh, into the fine arts yes. of the museum yes. circles. And Oop, we jumped ahead. Let's okay. go back into this. Um, yeah, no, he is amazing. And now he's working at the Fitchburg Art Museum, which yes, is why, yes. one of the reasons why I just had a show there recently. So again, going through this community, we're seeing the very first one uh, of um, Venus, who was the archetype, in my opinion, of the mall. She was narcissistic, narcissistic looking into the mirror. Uh, she's illuminated like kind of um, the Madonna. So she's the modern day Madonna in this environment. And it's yeah. material. It's all about yeah. materialism. You know, I the see huge it very earring. differently, though. Yeah, that's fine. Don't because forget this is open. What I see is this whole thing of young women being programmed and, yeah. and maybe wired, too, from their genes to be these objects of delight. You know? Right. <laughs> and this young innocent who is trying to put on a mask that will suit. Yeah. Suit yeah. the culture. Yeah. And yeah. That's you know, the way and, I, see and it. I think that's great. I think that's, that's phenomenal. That's the way I see it. You know, again, I, I work. I did a series about women in that role, young women being 
you know, pushed yeah. and formed and pressed and exposed to all these pressures. Well, let's it's, jump it's ahead very, to this uh, one here. Yeah. And there yeah, you go yeah. again. And this is a, a wannabe. This He's, is a Madonna wannabe. What, this is 1985. Am I? How can I be somebody? Yeah. What do I have as an asset? Yeah. My asset is what I have. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. So here you go, oh a wannabe boy. from Madonna oh, era. Yes. And again, you know, these photos are look, being looked at very differently and now. And the whole material girl thing, yeah. and what do I yeah. want? And How about boomboxes? What boxes? do I not want? You know, or do I want to be my mother? Do I, you right. know, oh man. It's all there. Yeah. And this is an era with boom boxes, which irritated all of us. Yeah. Where these kids would come along with a, a radio that's half the size of them carrying around, and you would see this uh, Again, commonplace. Again, it's like it's like an armor. It's yeah. like a concealment of yourself. It's a status, absolutely. It's, but it's a concealment of yourself yeah. because you're you're this. I'm yeah. big. I'm electronic. Yeah. I'm yeah. you know. Yeah, in some ways, the whole thing with iPods have equalized it again. Yes. So again, kids need to express themselves, and I'm totally into that, being an yeah, artist myself. Yeah. So we I actually, all go the, through so this I, trying I, to sh find out who we are. Yeah, I, I loved it when they were it punking was, out or they were into the heavy does metal. Anybody does that. Uh, to go through a couple of others, you know, the thing is that, matter of fact, here we got one with, we have one here with a pocketbook, and we see that the all-consuming pocketbook. Yes. That I have it in the foreground with uh, this uh, subject things. line in the background. And then just to go through a couple of others that, you know, you have all of these like uh, little uh, Even the Gap Levi's in the yeah, background. Yeah, you know, learners yeah. back here. Here's the lady who's selling, of all things, prunes and giving you pamphlets to promote this particular project. Or you have Warlock Witch Week every October right around Halloween with uh, Betsy Newton, who is reading tarot cards here. This was the function of the mall uh, on a daily basis. <coughs> Excuse me, that was the thing is that I didn't want to photograph the clowns or the mimes or the balloons. I, I wanted, wanted to the get real the people daily that thing that was yeah. happening with this. But you know, the thing about um, the mall was also the social center for these people. You know, the young kids, it yeah. still happens. You go there yeah. on a Friday night, it's yeah. the only place you can go these days. Yeah, it's the it, only place. Your, the parents let them off. It's a place to babysit it's, in some ways. It's a place where the parent feels somewhat yeah. safe to let the kid off in a, and they can walk around yeah. and interact with their peers and then and, get picked up at a reasonable hour. And, and you know, the, the age group that works there, the 20-somethings, uh, um, really, uh, some of them, like Venus I showed you, her goal was to work in every single store before she left there. That was very common. Why? There was this whole thing of consuming this environment and to work for the clothing store, to work oh, for so the bookstore. Oh, so you would get store. the discounts? Um, I think some of that might be involved, but it was also an ego thing. It basically con literally consumed the entire, uh, and this was, by the way, the Worcester Galleria uh, yeah, back yeah, then, yeah. and then it became the Worcester Fashion Common Out. Now mm -hmm. it's ready to be destroyed. Um, that there was this obsession about that. And you know, it wasn't that uh, we were no longer at Belle Pond, that there was nothing about others. It was all about, and I mentioned earlier, being an artist, me, 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 where a lot of these, these kids were into the whole, like that whole, I, that's kind of solipsistic kind of identity, that they were the center. Join Arts and Ideas again next time for part two of our continuing interview with photographer Steve Dorado.